Good. So I found no at home, but please go and try, okay? Um, all right, so there are a few things I want to mention before we, before we move on on the subject. Um, so what is really happening here? I mean, remember at the beginning I had a <coughs> one-dimensional system but the transfer function was only, um, was like a, the characteristic equation was a first order, remember? I mean, last week when I did these three examples, uh, the, the characteristic equation for, you know, I, 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 did, I, I gave two examples. Example one was, um, x dot is equal to 2x plus 2u and y is equal to 3x and I said the transfer function y divided by u of s for this would be 6 divided by s plus 2 right and then I gave another example and this example was um, unobservable uh, it was minus two zero zero one. I mean, you don't have to write this because we have written this. But one u y is equal to three zero x one x two, and the transfer function for this was actually also the same. And I said there's something going on here because this is a second order system. The second one here. How is it possible that we still have the same transfer function? In fact, the characteristic equation for both of them is, is, um, is the same, right? Uh, it, it's first order. I mean, this is a second order system, and this one here is a second order system, and it has a characteristic equation that's of first order, and this is a first order system. Uh, uh, the, the, the size of the system is one, and here you have, again, a characteristic equation or, or that has only one root. So the question is, what is going on here? How is this even possible? So if you have done, if you have developed these transfer functions in system dynamics, you might have heard of something called pole zero cancellation. Have you heard of that? Pole zero cancellations, right? This is something where you are trying to find the transfer function and something like this happens, right? You're trying to find the transfer function and something like this happens. I'm just, I'm just going to make this up now. S plus 1, S plus 2, and then you have S plus 1, S plus 2, S plus 3, right? And what's the order of the system? It's probably a th third order system, right? However, when you cancel these two, this is a pole and this is a zero, you cancel a pole and a zero, and suddenly it looks like it's a second order system. All right? Remember that? So when you do this over here, this is what happens here. You have probably a pole zero cancellation, so that although it's a second order system, it looks like a first order system. Okay? So you cancel this one with this one. So remember when you were, I hope you, you have taken system dynamics, right? So if you have, if you write on a complex plane, you have the, the roots and then the poles and then, you have, uh, and then you have zeros and then you might have a pole and a zero that are on top of each other, but on the system they just cancel each other, okay? So if they're canceling, um, then there is always something in the system where it is either uncontrollable or unobservable. Okay, so let, let me write that down as, as, a, as a little theorem here. Um, this is just to make the connection. Um, it's just to make a connection between the things we have done in system dynamics and what's happening over here. Of course, you know, I always make a trick here. This is really a single input, single output system, okay? 
I have one input u and I have one output y, although there are matrices here, you see the output is a number, and the input is a number, and therefore I can write these nice um, transfer functions, right? So let me write a little theorem. If there are whole zero cancellations, in the transfer function, transfer function of an LTI system then the system is either uncontrollable or not either not controllable or not observable or both. Okay. And you can actually continue. That's not really a theorem now, but Make it a note. If a CISO system, single input, single output system, the way we have is observable and controllable, then it is irreducible. You can't really reduce it because you're reducing it here, okay? Reducible meaning you can't make the transfer function simpler. That's what it means. You can't really cancel anything. That form, form is called the minimal realization. dynamic system. Let me, ex uh, let me explain this, what this means. Yeah, I mean, it, as I said at the beginning of the semester, if you, if you change these numbers a little bit, right, then you will not have this cancellation. I mean, you, you can only cancel this if this is like perfectly equal to each other, right? S plus 2, S plus 2. Now, in, in, in engineering, you could put a point 0.1 over here and probably nothing will happen, and then you will not have this cancellation, okay? Then therefore, Yes, we could do stuff like that in engineering so that these are not canceled, okay? Same thing actually applies for these tests. I mean, look up here. This is actually an important point. Look up here. This one here, all right, the test. We say if this is full rank, then system is observable or controllable, whatever. In this case, it's observable, right? That's, that's what we are looking at. Now, if it's not full rank, what do you do? You say, oh, okay, I cannot design a controller. We'll see. Now, here's the funny thing. You change a, probably a, one number just a little bit, and suddenly you have full rank. Because all you're looking at is linear dependence, right? Is there linear dependence between this line, this line, this line? Let's say there's linear dependence between two of the lines, between two of the rows, right? 
What happens if you just change one single number to just a little bit and suddenly they are not linearly dependent anymore? I'm just saying if you had something like this, let's say you have 3, 6, 5, right? And uh, the second line, the second row will be 6, 12, 10. Are they linearly dependent? Of course, I multiplied by 2, right? So they are linearly dependent. So if I would just change this one number in the C matrix with 0 0.1, suddenly you don't have that anymore. There's no more linear dependence, right? So, I mean, from an engineering point of view, a 0 and a 3 and a 3.01 is really not that big of a difference. I'm just saying in a practical sense, you could actually add a little tiny fraction of a number somewhere and suddenly this test will show you observable. Let me tell you another secret. In real life, in applications, it's very rare that you get actually an unobservable system and this becomes not full rank in real life. Because the numbers that you obtain from a measurement or from a calculation from an airplane, let's say, they are never perfect like this. I mean, you must, be, you must get really lucky to get 3, 6, 5, 6, 12, 10, exactly those numbers, and then put it into this test, and it will become unobservable. I mean, what are the odds, right? Because the numbers that you measure in airplanes, you know, you're measuring angles, angular velocities, you know, linear velocities and things like that. If you do the dynamics, and if you remember, that dynamics is always related to partial derivatives. And partial derivatives, they are either coming from a CFD solution or they're coming from a wind tunnel solution. And what are the odds to find a combination of, um, of uh, partial derivatives that will make this matrix not full rank? What are the odds? See? So that's almost never, that almost really never happens. However, here's just, here, here is what's, what's, what's important. Though you put a 0 0.1 over here, and this one suddenly becomes full rank, it still does not change the fact that you don't really see much of that, of that, uh, of that uh, state that is, it, according to this test, is now observable, but in reality, you don't really see much of it. Okay? Remember that example where, I think it was this one here, the unobservable example? I have two zeros over here, right? And then I have um, uh, x1, and I say I cannot measure x2 here because x2 is not observable in the system, remember? Okay, now, if I put, not zero here, but let's put a 0 0.001 over here, okay? What happened now? Now, x2 is related to x1, and I measure x1, therefore I, I can see x2, okay? So if I do the test, or observability test, it will definitely become full rank. And suddenly we will say, oh, the system is observable, perfect, okay? But from a practical point of view, the influence of x2 onto x1 is so small that yes, we, we, we observe it, but it's very, very, very weak in the signal. And in practice, it will probably will be get lost in the noise in practice. Mathematically, perfect. This is an observable system. And probably if I do uh, the transfer function, I will never see the pole zero cancellation. Okay, so it will be third order, looks great, everything wonderful. Okay, observable, let's do the controller. But the signal is very, very weak. Okay, the relation between x1 and x2 now is very weak. Do you see it in Y? Yes. In practice, it will probably get lost in noise. All right, so what do you do? Now, there are other tests that can be done
to sort out these things, to look at observable and unobservable signals. And there we don't look at the ultimate thing. We don't, I mean, you know, what we are looking here is, I can't see it at all, right? Then I call it unobservable. But what if I see it very little? I mean, how good do I see it in the signal? You know, if this is 0 0.001, I don't see anything. How about this one? Not 0 0.001, but I put a 5 over here, then I know the signal in x1 is very strong, it's multiplied by 5. Any change in x2 will be reflected in the y in a, in a big way, right? So, in order to sort out these kind of things, there are other tests, okay? And I wanted to give that to you as a, as a homework, and maybe I'll still do that. But for now, you just need to be aware of this. But you also have to understand for now that this is a classic observability, observability test, and this is a classic controllability test that I've taught you. Open any book, okay? Typically, this is what you will see. From a practice point of view, I'm just telling you this is not enough. And this is the reason. It's very rare that you get an exact zero over here, unless really it's a dynamics that is absolutely unrelated. I, I, I've, I've given you some examples. I, I told you when you have an airplane, you have something called flutter on the wings, right? It's a dynamics that we don't consider, that we don't even write. Is it there? Yes. So if the, if the wing goes up, it will reduce angle of attack. Goes down, it will increase angle of attack. So there's a constant movement in angle of attack because of this wing. Is it in the rigid body dynamics? We don't even write it, right? If I would put it in there and I don't measure it, I would probably don't see it, okay? If you ask me, is there absolutely no effect of the flutter onto the rigid body dynamics, the answer is, of course there is. It's changing angle of attack, so it will go up and down, it will change everything in the airplane. But it's very minimal. And if I wanted to measure it through, the, through, my, um, through my oscillations, is it somewhat related to the, to the flutter? Well, you could probably write something down, but I'm not sure if your measurement is sensitive enough to pick up that movement of the airplane because of this change in angle of attack. Okay? So it will probably get lost. So this is something probably unobservable to you. Okay? But it would be somewhere in those measurements. So, long story short, you know, controls engineers, especially in aerospace, they are the ones they need to make these decisions. They need to make these um, judgments on where to ignore things, where to make assumptions, okay, and where to say this method is suitable or not suitable. In order to do that, you need to understand those methods. Don't memorize, okay, just understand where they're coming from. That's why I make an effort to try to explain, at least give you a feel of where things are coming from. I could have just told you saying that, oh, we just look at this and that is your, um, that is your test. But I wanted to show you where it's coming from. I, and I, I realize there are, um, when I make the proofs, I go a little fast and there are always, a, every now and then there are, uh, there might be some empty uh, spaces, you know, where, you, where you're not sure if it's, where what is coming from, okay? But you at least have an idea, okay? That's what I'm trying to do in this undergraduate class. Um, okay, so that's that. Any other questions? And this is an important question, of course. Because in practice, right, you never get exactly zero. Or you might get, but it's very rare, right? So any other question? Okay, there's one more thing before I close this topic. I will just give you the definitions for that so that you know 
when you hear about it that you know what it is. We are not going to work with them, but there's some weaker conditions. Some weaker conditions. An LTI system is called detectable detectable if all unstable modes are observable. Another one, an LTI system is called Stabilizable with all unstable modes are controllable. So two definitions, I, you know, we are not going to do anything with this in this class, but I want you to have heard of these terms. I mean, we, called, we talked about observable, controllable, very important two concepts, but there are two other things that, that you, might have, you might need to learn. An LTI system is called detectable, and this is called stabilizable. An LTI system is called detectable if all unstable modes are observable. An LTI system is called stabilizable if all unstable modes are controllable. Modes meaning the poles. In the complex plane, if you have two poles here and one pole over here, and let's say you cannot control this one or you cannot observe, but you can control these two, then we'll call it stabilizable because we can move these ones I cannot do anything about this one or these are observable and this is not observable I don't care because it's stable it's a weaker condition now we always talked about controllable and stabilizable we, uh, controllable and uh, observable we talked about states right states are controllable not modes we don't really talk about modes states are controllable states are observable that's what I said so far but here I'm talking about modes, unstable modes. So every state that is related to these modes must be stabilizable. Or every state that is related to these modes must be controllable. Okay? So then I would call it stabilizable and detectable. That's, that's the little subtle difference over here. We're not talking about states, we're talking about modes. Okay? As I said, I'm not going to do much about this, just so you know, this is what it means. You understand that? Okay. Good. So any questions on this observability, controllability? This is the end of it. This is all I wanted to say. And there's a lot of information about this in literature, of course. If you want to read more, understand more, please go and read. Um, again, this is an undergraduate class where I'm trying to go fast and just to give you the concept. I, th I think we spend enough time on this anyway. Yes? Yes, of course, the output can be zero, but there was a, I defined a special condition. The special condition was there's no input to the system, and we are not at the equilibrium point, which means we are somewhere, we don't touch it, I know the system is going to move. If I still measure zero, that means I cannot measure it because I know it's moving. 
that's, that was a special condition for, for that observability. It's like saying that I have a pendulum over here and let's see if my sensor works. How do you check if my sensor works? Let's say I'm trying to measure the angle of the pendulum, right? How do I check it? If I don't see it, of course, right? I move it here, leave it alone, and I see that it's moving and I measure zero. Then I say, okay, the sensor is not working. Basically, the measurement is zero, so the output of the system, as far as I'm concerned, is zero, but I know it's moving. So how do I guarantee it's going to move? If I don't keep it in the equilibrium point, keep it somewhere else and leave it, I know it's going to move because it's not the equilibrium. It only doesn't move in the equilibrium, it doesn't move, but anywhere else it will move, right? That was the condition. Is that, is that clear? Any other question? I think it's uh, time for a homework. I will put a homework on the website. And I think within the next two weeks we should have our midterm one. Okay? I will write you, um, I, will, I will fix a date, I don't know, whatever. I'll put it on the website. Okay? All right. Um, that's the end of this topic. And state feedback control. Now we, uh, full state feedback control. All right, so we are at the core of the class uh, in terms of the topics. Consider the general LTI system. Is that equals a x plus b u y is equal to cx plus du, a is an n by n, and b is an n by m. So, and this is where we start, okay? This is, this is where we start. This is where we start. We start with an LTI system. So, Make sure we didn't miss anything. If you write this in a block diagram, what you see over here will look like this, right? You take U, you multiply it with a matrix B, get X dot, take an integral, get X. Multiply it with A. Sorry. Multiply it with C.
So input is u. And center, right? So this is the integral here. I mean, I, 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 I put an integral signal like this. Integral. I mean, you know, in system dynamics, we used to write 1 over s, remember, for integral in the Laplace domain. But here, since we are not in the Laplace domain, I'm just going to write a symbol that represents taking the integral. Okay? So if you look at this, you take u multiplied with b, add x plus a, x times a, you add it to this, and then you get x dot. See that? And then you take the integral of x dot, you get x, right? And then you multiply it with c, and then add d times u, and you get y. Is that clear? Probably quite straightforward, right? The input is u. So this is like a funny block diagram. It's not really the block diagram that you see in system dynamics where you write transfer functions and you write uh, blocks in the Laplace domain. Uh, I'm just writing matrices in this that looks kind of like a block diagram, but it's not that block diagram that you see in system dynamics. So input is u, output is y. Is there any control in the system? Like a controller, let's just say. No, this is just a representation of the LTI system, okay? So this part here, this whole thing, is nothing but a representation of the LTI system. It's a linear time invariant system. And since there's no controller, we call it an open loop system. Open loop system. Okay, it's open loop because there is no controller. It's basically the natural system, the natural, uh, the way the physics works, let's say if it's an airplane, this is how the airplane works without a controller. Okay, it's an open loop system, it's the LTI system, this is what I would call this. Okay. So let's call this the LTI. So what you, we are having here is we have U, we have an LTI system, linear time invariant system, and the output is Y. Sometimes I would write it like this, U x dot is equal to AX plus BU, Y is equal to CX plus DU. This would be an LTI system, and these, these are all open loop representations of my linear system. Now, if you open up Simulink, you know, MATLAB Simulink, you know, it's, very, it's a very useful tool in what we do. If you open Simulink, the representation for a linear system is actually like this. The box will look like this, because it's a linear system, open loop, right, this. So this, open up this. It will, it will look like that. That's 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 that. All right. So now, if you want to have a controller, a typical controller would like look like this, right? It would take the LTI. The output would be y. You would take this y, do something over here. Do something over here plus, minus, and let's call this u hat, and suddenly you have a controller, and it's a feedback controller. It's feeding back the measurement and doing something to the control, adding something to the control, and helping probably the user now is over here, and this part here now, that's another system, right, where the output is still y, but it looks now like this, u prime, and here you don't have that open loop system anymore, it's actually the open loop or we have the LTI, the linear time invariant system, plus we have a controller, 
and the output is y. Okay? And because we have a feedback here, we call it a closed loop system. Okay? Because now we close the loop. This is the loop, input, output, right? So it moves this way, so we are going from here to here and then backwards here to here. So we're closing the loop inside this thing. So the user, the pilot in our case, right, in aerospace, it would be here. He's now outside, but inside there is more stuff happening. So this would be a closed loop system. It can so happen that the closed loop system itself is another LTI system. I mean, it, it can, so, depending on the controller, if it's a linear controller, this will be again a linear time invariant system as a whole. Okay? This can be a linear time invariant system as a whole. Okay. But this terminology you really have to understand closed loop versus open loop and all that stuff. Now, consider this special case. Consider this special case. Okay? Now it's going to be a special one. Right? So, B plus plus x dot integral x C, Y, Special case. C is equal to the identity, so basically, and D is equal to zero. Special case. So which basically means Y is equal to X. Okay, so special case. Oh, and sorry, of course you get This one here this is still my open loop system and this one here this is the closed loop. Understand? 
you just have to, um, when you copy the board, I mean, this is just, uh, this is just the open loop system that I wrote here, except d is equal to zero and c is equal to i. And I just had a feedback gain k it goes here, that's it. And I put an r over here. Right. So do you understand this? All I did was I took this, removed D, and instead of C, I put an I, an identity matrix, so that X is equal to Y. So I'm feeding back this Y, multiply it with K, and send it over here. Okay? So basically, I'm sending back the whole state X. Okay? So I'm feeding back the whole state X over here. And this is the system or this is the architecture we are going to look at for, for the next few weeks. When I say full state feedback, this is what I mean. I take the full state, everything, and feed it back into the system. And because it's going to be a linear controller, there's going to be just a matrix K because now K is a matrix because Y is a vector and y is equal to x, x is a vector, it's a state vector. So I'm basically feeding back the whole state, and this is nothing but x here, the whole state is fed back to k, and then it's subtracted from the controls. The controls can only also be a vector. Okay, r is also a vector. Think of an airplane, if you want to control the whole airplane with a full state feedback controller, how many controls do you have on the rigid, rigid body Airplane, you have four controls, right? Elevator, aileron, so you have four controls over here. How many states do you have on the, on the rigid body uh, dynamics? Eight states, right? P, Q, R, U, V, W, theta, phi. So eight states, four controls. So this would be a matrix, right? So this would be a matrix. Of course, this is not exactly how you design a controller for an airplane, but just to give you an example. So this is what it looks like. And this is what we call a full state feedback controller. It's a full state. We are feeding back the whole state, everything, over here. Now, in order to make things a little bit more easier or more apparent, I'm going to write this system in the following way. I'm going to write it like this. So I'm going to just write it like this. So what did I do? I just removed this identity and this y, and I just say I'm feeding back x times k and all that. This is just to make things um, quicker and simpler to write, I mean, to, to not to clutter things. I mean, is it possible to feed back x as it is? If there's no measurement, sure not, right? We have to have that measurement. If you don't measure it, it's ridiculous to say I'm feeding back this full state. I mean, if you don't measure it, what are you feeding back, right? So you need to feed back the whole system, which means you have to measure it some one way or the other, or you need to estimate it. That's we, we're going to see it as well later in the class. When, you, when, we don't, when we can't measure it, we will need to estimate it if you don't measure it. Therefore. Whether you estimate it or you actually measure it, I don't care, really, okay? In this, 
class and in the next few weeks, we will try to calculate k, assuming that x is available to us. Okay, so the job will be design k, which in this case is a matrix, such that, no, assuming, assuming x is available. Sign k, assuming x is available. And when I say available, then you either measure, right? You can measure it. You can estimate it. Or something else. Right? Measure or estimate, whatever. No, no, no. K is just a matrix. K is just a matrix. Everything you see in this picture is a matrix. B is a matrix. A is a matrix. And K is another matrix. Okay? So you might ask, this is new, right? Let me make this in red. You might ask, let's put this in red. You might ask, where did this come from? Right? This is now new. Where did this come from? And what does it, what is it used for? It is not anywhere in the system. Now, let's write the equations, before we give a break, let's write the equations for the system now. Right? This is x, this is I'm sorry, this is x dot, you have x, and you have this. Okay? Let's write the equations. What do we have now? Let, let me write x dot. x dot is equal to, what is it equal to? ax, right? ax plus b times r minus k times x. And this part is actually equal to u, this one. Is that right? k being a matrix, it's a matrix, and it's, it's what we call the controller gain. Is that, is that clear? Is that easy to understand? How I wrote this? R minus K times X is equal to U times B plus A times X is equal to X dot. Okay? So, any questions up to here? So, X dot is equal to Let's do some multiplications and some manipulations here. What do you get? You get AX plus BR minus BKX. X dot is equal to A minus BK times X plus BR. Okay, and this is represents this. Question number one, is this an LTI system what you have over here? This is now a closed loop system. It's a representation of that block is now over here. Is this an LTI system? Is it a linear time invariant system? In other words, is this a matrix A minus BK? Is it a matrix? Yes. Is it changing in time? No, if k is constant, it will not change in time, right? B, 
is a matrix. R is the input. X is a state. So is, would it be possible to say that this, let's call this A prime, A minus BK, let's call it A prime. So let's say A prime is equal to A minus BK, okay, another matrix, and therefore call this thing X dot is equal to A prime X plus B times R. Can I write it like this? Yes or no? Yes, of course. A minus BK is a matrix, so I'm going to write it like this. Now, is this a linear time invariant system? Yes, it looks a lot like this, actually. It looks a lot like this, except it's not A, but it's A, A prime. So, but the input now is not U, but it's R. Right? The input now is R. It's not U anymore. So the pilot is sitting not here in the U, but the pilot would be sitting here and controlling the R. It is another system where we take the pilot and move it one step ahead. I mean, outer in the loop and he's controlling R. The output of the, 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 the system dynamics of the system is A prime. Okay, now. Assume you have a system that looks like this, okay? How do we check stability for this? Is this system stable or unstable? What do I look at? I look at the A matrix, I look at the eigenvalue of the A matrix, and then I say, oh, it's stable, unstable, okay? What should I do here in order to check stability for this? I need to look at the eigenvalues of A prime. Now, here's an interesting thing. A prime is A minus BK. And V will be designing K. Basically, we will tell what K should be. So, can I choose K such that the eigenvalues of A prime are stable? Yes, that's what we are doing in this class. Okay. Can I make the system very stable, very stable meaning that you know eigenvalues far away in the, in the, in the complex plane, right? Remember, when the eigenvalues of the, are far away in this direction, because the eigenvalues will be e to the power minus blah blah, the larger they become, the faster they go to zero, remember? So, can I choose k such that the eigenvalues of A prime go all the way this way. Yes. That's another thing we do in this class. We can make it go quickly to zero. Can we choose the eigenvalues such that they are here? So they oscillate. Yes. Can I choose the eigenvalues of A prime such that the eigenvalues are here? Basically, they go slowly to the, to the, to the equilibrium. Yes. And that's what we are doing in this class. We learn how to design K, how to choose K, which is a matrix, such that the closed loop system is manipulated such that the eigenvalues are wherever I want them to be. Assume you have an open loop system, an airplane, where the eigenvalues are here. They are unstable. Now let's choose this K such that the eigenvalues move to this side. Can I do it? Yes. So it's magic. We can take an airplane that is unstable and we can make it stable. We can make it super stable. We can make it less stable. We can make it oscillatory. We can make it less oscillatory. All by choosing this K. So this K over here is it, it is quite magic. I mean, there are so many things you can do by choosing this K appropriately, okay? So you probably wondered why I moved from this open loop system to a closed loop system like this and suddenly put a K over here. Well, this is a picture you will be seeing for the rest of the semester, okay? How do I design K? How do I, do I design K? 
The assumption here is that, though, keep in mind that I'm feeding back the whole x. If I don't feed back the whole x, I cannot move this bkx into this thing, remember? I mean, I'm, the only reason I can move it into this a prime, a minus bk, x, is because k times x is here. If I had k times y, I cannot do this, you see? You see that if this was y, I can't put it into this parenthesis, and therefore I wouldn't be able to put an a prime. So that would be something else. If you had y over here, this problem would be a lot different, and in fact, a lot more difficult. Okay? This is what we call full state feedback control. Full state feedback control. Because we are feeding back the full state. If you would be feeding back y, okay, like this one, right here I was feeding back y, we would call this output feedback control. Output feedback <coughs> control. Because here I'm feeding back the output y. And I'm telling you this is a much more difficult problem. OK? You understand that? This is called output feedback. You feed back y. In this case, we are feeding back x. And if you can feed back x, then you can do this. And this becomes such a nice problem where you manipulate k such that you move the eigenvalues of the closed loop system anywhere you want. So you look at this thing here now. OK? Here is R, the input. This is your pilot. He's moving his pilot the, the pilot stick, the, the, the throttle, everything over here. The output is x. OK? And inside this part, well, it's another black box that the pilot doesn't need to know about. OK? For a pilot sitting in the cockpit flying the airplane without a controller, basically you connect everything to you and he sees the, he sees the output. Or he, you can connect his controls to R and inside we do a lot of stuff. He doesn't really know or doesn't, even, I mean he will know, but he doesn't need to understand exactly what's going on inside. What's happening here? It's our business. Okay, and we choose k such that a prime is nice, such that the eigenvalues are where they are supposed to be, and so that the pilot is happy. Okay. Okay, so let's now we can give a break. Okay, see you in five minutes. Don't get, don't spend too much time outside.